when I do my classes, first thing I tell everybody is at least 80% of what you see on YouTube is bad, bad, bad information. <laughs> Throw most of it away. And I'll tell you why. There, I think there's a couple reasons. One, there are people out there that just put garbage out there because they want to sell stuff. They don't care what it is. They're not, they don't prove it. They just, there's a few of those. I think in most cases, and I'm not picking on you, but somebody who sits around, watches a couple hundred YouTube videos, gets all excited and thinks, hey, I can do this, gets some ideas, puts it together on the weekend, and he films himself doing that, but he doesn't go back three weeks later and say, this is why it didn't work, this is what I learned. Because unfortunately, that's the big problem with YouTube, is you can put anything on there, and a lot of stuff that's on there might look cool, might look fun, but in reality, it doesn't work. So the best, my suggestion is to find people who are really doing it, making money at it, who really have successful systems and mimic what they're doing because aquaponics can be scalable. It can be very small, it can be very large uh, and start small. But don't believe most of the stuff you see on YouTube. Just your stuff. You can believe my stuff, and there's a few <laughs> others. There are a few other people out there that have good stuff. That's Actually, that's why I started my YouTube channel, because there's so much bad information out there. I, I only show stuff that is that I know works. That has, And there are other channels out there that do the same thing. And, so, and I, I watch a bunch of those, too, uh, on different subjects. And, you know, if somebody's doing it and successful at it, you can kind of count on what they're showing you is pretty reliable. But there's so many weekend warriors out there that uh, it's just not a good scenario. So how many know, besides Doug, how many know how aquaponics works? Did I say hydroponics or aquaponics? You said aquaponics. Okay, so how many know how hydroponics work? So hydroponics has been around for decades, very sophisticated business. And it basically uses man-made chemicals in water or some sort of gravel media to grow plants. Most of the plants that you get from the grocery store are grown in hydroponics. They're, they all look the same because they only had one choice of food, whatever chemicals they put in the system, and they all taste the same, pretty bland. Because that's not how nature grows things. Nature doesn't grow twins. So aquaponics uses the gravel or water, but we use fish as the fertilizer source. So behind you there, you'll see there's a 750 gallon fish tank, and we like to grow catfish. Uh, catfish, because here the water temperatures can vary between summer and winter quite a bit. And most people, if you watch one of the mistakes on YouTube, is everybody uses tilapia. Well, tilapia at 55 degrees, they start to die. At 85 degrees, they die. And our temperatures can swing. So either you got to pay to heat and cool water all year, which to me never made any sense, or you put your fish in there that can handle the temperature difference. And uh, that's what that's why we use that's why we use uh, catfish. So, anyway, so we start with the tank, and if you'll notice in there, there's a pump. And the pump, which is in a higher elevation than this greenhouse, and that greenhouse has all got gravel beds in it. And anybody give a guess as to why we, I have two separate greenhouses for one aquaponic system? Any logic in there? Because why? Aquaponics does filter the water, that's what the gravels do, but that's not why I have two greenhouses. In this greenhouse, in the rafts, traditionally will grow leafy greens. It uses ethylene gas to ripen and it'll ruin the lettuce if it's in one greenhouse. So I split the greenhouses so I can grow fruiting plants in one and lettuce in the other. Which worked really well until I discovered you can't really make any money growing tomatoes in an aquaponic greenhouse. <laughs> I, I make $50 a month in tomatoes, where this greenhouse would do $1,600 a month in lettuce. 
So that didn't make any sense to me. So as you'll see, now I've changed. All I grow in both greenhouses is lettuce. So, so I could have made it all one, but that's why they're separate. So the water, the fish water, gets pumped up into the gravel beds, and bacteria break down the uh, fish waste into different, and eventually into nit 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 nitrite, uh, nitrates, I mean, to fertilize the plants. And nitrate has four oxygen molecules and one nitrogen molecule, and when the plant consumes it, it releases the oxygen and consumes the nitrogen, so it purifies the water. The bacteria that make all that happen, they like to cling on to stuff, so it's a good place to have it in the gravel they build up on the gravel and, and it's also got worms in there. Worms is a great best anyway let me let me put it this way. What comes out of the south end of a northbound worm? <laughs> Castings. Mm -hmm. Right. Anybody know what a casting is? It's it's right, it's worm poo, but it's broken down to the most basic elements. When the root of a plant touches a worm casting, it automatically can absorb all the nutrients off of that. And then once it's done that, it's then sterile. So now that sterile casting, you know what we call that? It's called dirt. <laughs> That's how we get dirt. So worms are, are one of the best farmers on the planet because they they make dirt and that's why when you have a dirt garden you've always got to add compost and other things because dirt can go sterile just because you have dirt doesn't mean you can grow something you have to have good dirt anyway so the water pumps up and that's why that greenhouse is up elevated so i have one pump running the whole greenhouse and then you can see here where the water comes back by gravity there's four zones in the other greenhouse. So one zone runs for five minutes, and then it'll switch to another zone. It goes back and forth. So the water's constantly flowing. By the time it gets back to the fish, you can actually drink it. It's so pure. So that's, that's how that uh, works. And you're welcome to take whatever pictures or ask any questions. But uh, well, that's a good question. So I've got air pumps. Because even though this is plants are growing in water, the roots still need oxygen. So you still have to pump oxygen into the water to get the plants to grow. So, great question. So, how long have these plants been in uh, They were just planted a couple days ago. <laughs> so, the way it works is we sprout in the gravel. It takes about two weeks for the plant to get big enough to transplant. And then we put it in here, and three or four weeks later, it's ready to harvest. So yeah, it takes five to six weeks to grow a head of lettuce. And then the lettuce I have over here, this is called Selenova, and it's the kind of lettuce that you've seen the spring mix. So we cut that, that's the spring mix, and it'll grow back. So you can do that up to three times. You can cut it, it'll grow back. And when it grows back, it only takes about two weeks. So that's, and you can see how empty it is because I haven't figured out the market yet. Either I have too much lettuce and no market, or I have market and not enough lettuce because lettuce doesn't stop growing. So my my chickens and my goats eat better than most humans do. So who is your, who is your customer? Uh, I have restaurants and individuals and, and some farmers markets. I don't go to the farmers market, but I I give my stuff to other people who go there and sell it. So we do that with the eggs, the aquaponics. I only grow leafy greens in it, and then I've got wicking bags and food forests that we grow other vegetables and we sell those in the season also. Don't really sell fish yet. It requires two licenses because the uh, game and fish, uh -huh. even though they don't know I have fish, legally they own my fish. Uh, okay. So I have to have a license from them and then I have to have a USDA license to sell fish. So I don't sell fish, but if you get an aquaponics, you're not getting into it for the fish. 
There's enough for you to eat, but there's not really enough to sell. So how many fish do you have in there to get all the toppers? Typically, I run about 75 fish. About one fish for every 10 gallons. So it doesn't take too much. And then, besides that, I also have back in this corner what's called a compost tea maker. I make my own compost tea. And again, here's the place where YouTube is just, I wouldn't even waste my time with anybody on YouTube with compost tea. It's just a mess. And I can show you, I've got to do a video on that, but I just use uh, two ingredients, mycorrhiza and archaea, that are active and they're natural. And uh, I put in iron and magnesium. Now, iron and magnesium doesn't grow, but the plants need it. And I, once a week, I put that uh, solution. I just I have a hose, and I just let it run into the aquifer. And it'll make the difference. It's like a high school football team versus an NFL team. <laughs> That's the difference in using compost tea. But do it the right way, because you'll see on, they got horse manure and all kinds of it. I mean, it's just a mess. If you ever watch on YouTube some of the stuff people do to make compost tea, it's crazy. You don't need all that. The mycorrhiza, what that does is it, it creates single cell organisms that uh, go out and they collect food and they bring it to the plants. They attach themselves to the roots. And the archaea is a nitrifier and it turns uh, other substances into nitrogen so that the plants can consume it. That's all you need. Uh, I buy them uh, and I sell them too uh, from a local store here, uh, Bright Ideas. You, you can get them on almost any uh, nursery. It's pretty, pretty common stuff. Y'all want to move forward a bit? All right, shall we go to the other greenhouse real quick? Uh oh, okay. now we're moving. Oh, now we're moving. Yeah. Now we're moving. So, that bed there, that's uh, beet greens. If anybody wants to take some beet greens home, you're welcome to cut some and take them there. If you've never had them, if you like spinach, to me, beet greens are a whole level above spinach in flavor and taste. You just boil them, put a little butter on them, and they're fantastic. So I was growing them to put in my, my lettuce when I do the mix, but I found out that kale and beet greens all dry and different and so I, I haven't got that all worked out yet but there's they're getting big and you're welcome to take some if you want. But here in the gravel beds this is the uh, the mix. We'll just cut it, clean it, I've got a cleaning process and then uh, it'll grow back to eat. So we'll we'll get two or three growths out of that also. Uh, and then there, there's the the cut and come again type lettuce. Now there was a question here. You had a question about shade cloth. Right? Yeah, the percentage of shade cloth for the greens. So this question is, what percentage of shade cloth should you use? And um, I do have a YouTube video where I show putting on the shade cloth and I talk about that. This one is a 50% shade cloth. And it's a 50% because I used to grow tomatoes and peppers in here. And so it's, it's a le less of a shade cloth. The one on the lettuce greenhouse is a 70% block. Now, if I knew I was gonna do, I would have put 70% block on this too. But has anybody ever mowed a lawn where there's a trampoline there? You know what happens, the grass is two feet tall on the trampoline, right? That's like a 90% block. So the sun can stress plants. Even though the plants need sun, it can also stress them and, and prevent growth so that's why you put on the shade cloth and that allows and I can grow lettuce all summer long now the other thing that allows me to grow is plants sense the temperature from their roots not from their leaves so it could be a hundred degrees in the greenhouse but the water is 80 degrees the lettuce thinks it's 80 degrees now I can't really harvest when it's a hundred because physics does you know, it'll wilt real quick, but the, the lettuce survives, and I harvest early in the morning or at, late at night, and it does just fine uh, because the water temperature keeps it cooler. So you can't really do that in the summer in a raised bed or something. The lettuce won't 
it'll bolt too quickly. And you know it's mine's not doing that. And what's the benefit of growing it here in the gravel bed versus the floating bed? Uh, for, for leafy greens, there's no benefit. The gravel, uh, one reason you have gravel, so if you look online, you'll see a lot of people who do aquaponics only do rack systems, which means they also have a filtration system to filter out all the extra waste. And when I was building mine, I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why, why do you have all these steps? you know, to cause you extra work. So gravel is a natural filter. So all the water comes into the gravel first, it gets filtered, and this was set up originally to grow tomatoes and peppers, which you do in the gravel. In fact, the tomatoes like to put their roots all the way down in the very bottom into the muck. They love that stuff. But you, you probably didn't hear me earlier when I said, when I had this, that's why these wires are here, and. I had tomatoes. Tomatoes were taking forever of my time. I mean, I'd spend a couple hours a day, and I was making fifty dollars a month in sales on tomatoes. Whereas in the greenhouse, the lettuce you make sixteen hundred dollars a month. So it didn't make any sense to keep growing tomatoes. So everything's now lettuce. You said you start them in here. Yeah, yeah. You just it's. And then you put them in one of those rounds. Yeah. Yeah, you just uh, harvest it up. Okay, I just look curious. Oh, you see the roots? Mm -hmm. Now this this lettuce, you transplant or move anywhere because it's aquaponic, they won't even know it got moved. So, so you just scatter the seeds? So in the yeah, I sprinkle the seeds on there and then I take my hand. I got videos on that too, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and I just kind of pat it in. It takes like 30 seconds to mm -hmm. see the whole bed. Mm -hmm. And within about three days they've germinated. So this guy here, all I have to do is put him back in. And he'll never know he got moved. It's only gravel too, yep. It's only gravel. No, no dirt. No, no dirt. No dirt. And I, I said, here there's four zones. You can see this zone right here is running right now. There's water coming out. So it'll shut off for 30 seconds and then the other side will kick in and then it goes back and forth. Bob, are you using the uh, uh, valves to do that? No, this is flood and drain. Flood and drain. So if you look inside one of these, it's just got a standpipe. The, the bell siphon or? No. Bell siphons are way too efficient. And they would suck all the water out of this first little area and the water on the ends would never get moved. So I quit using bell siphons. Um, I mean, they work, but over time, your gravel gets full of worms and castings and roots and stuff like that. So the water doesn't flow through as quickly. So this way, the water's off for 15, 17 minutes at a time. So it allows the bed to completely drain. And you're finding the, the water to flow again. Right, it switches back and forth. Because it's important that uh, the bed be able to drain and bring all that fresh air in. So a flood and drain system is a lot more efficient. Now you got a timer you've added to it, but as far as the plants go, it's a much, much well, healthier. Yeah, I only have the full system, so. Right. Yeah, if you're a small little system, a bell cycle is fine. But when you go larger, I wouldn't use a bell cycle. <laughs> Any other questions? So, yes. Oh, sorry. We'll go Frank and then you. Do you have worms in these beds? Yes, we have red wigglers. And you can't just put any worm in your aquaponic system, by the way, because worms can carry E. coli. So you have to get, so if, if you start a system, just come see me and I'll give you worms. Because these worms are clean, they've, they've lived here for years, and uh, otherwise if you buy them, they're quite expensive. Because they, they, have, they have to be proven clean. Um, yeah, they're usually around, uh, the water where the water comes in. You had a question? Okay, so this this, this greenhouse is higher up. So the water when it leaves here, then it does it go down to the other greenhouse? Yes, yeah, so there's a pipe that runs underneath and all these all these drain into it. And so as as these beds drain it flows into the other greenhouse. So this greenhouse is up higher. By the way, how much do you think it costs me a month 
to run this whole greenhouse. Electricity. I just got one pump. I got one pump. Uh, and I got some air pumps. Six dollars. <laughs> so it costs a lot of money to build a system, but once you've built it, they're pretty I spend more money on seeds than I do on electricity. So they're pretty efficient once they're set up and going. Plus this uh, shade, uh, this plastic I use is a triple weave, 11 mil. I'm a distributor for that. And it, it, it's good for 12 to 15 years. In fact, if you notice, it's all cloudy and raining out right now. Did you notice how bright it is in here? Even with the shade cloth, because as the light comes in, it acts like a prism and it diffuses light. So it's actually lighter in the greenhouse than it is outside. How much, how much is this to build this system? To build this system was about $20,000. Yeah. So that's why I say if you're going to start, you know, if you're going to start, build a very small one. Just see what it's like, if you like it. Because a lot of people, it's not like regular gardening where you just throw some compost in, till it up or whatever, plant your plants and you come back and pull weeds once in a while and then harvest. Aquaponics isn't like that. You got fish to feed. You got to make sure your pipes are running correctly. For example, as I was explaining how this thing flows, I noticed that every valve here is running. So I'm not getting, I'm not getting the cycle, which means the main valve that cycles this. It's a mechanical valve. What that means is that there's probably a, some grass or some debris that got in there and it's preventing it from turning. So I'll have to pull that apart uh, in the next day or two. I mean, it's not going to hurt, but I'm not getting that cycle. So there's always things you got to look at and check. Uh, like when Brian leaves or Phil leaves or I leave for a week or weekend, we always kind of check with each other to make sure uh, somebody's there to keep an eye on something or feed the fish or make sure a pipe didn't break. Because it'll always break when you're gone. <laughs> I think you've had some of those problems. All your fish died one time, right, when you were gone. So, it, so it's not quite like it, it, you do have to. Yeah, you have to put a little effort into it every day. Great questions. Any any other questions? If someone was going to start small, would yes. they start with like a gravel one and a floating one? Is that what most people would do? And I'll tell you what. If you wanted to start small, what I would do was go to a garage sale and find a 10 or 20 gallon fish tank somebody's trying to get rid of and just get a little tote put some gravel in it now the thing about the gravel is it's got to be pH neutral which means this is all crushed granite so it's pH neutral and the way you do that if wherever you get your rock if you take a mason jar and some vinegar and you put the rock in the mason jar and fill it up if it bubbles it's not pH neutral. If it doesn't bubble, you can use that rock because you don't want to add pH to your system. They sell something at the garden center that's like for aquaponics, like that. Yeah, it's, it's called set. probably called hydrotone. Right. Yeah, very expensive, but on a small scale, you could do that. So what I would do is I would set up a fish tank, put a tote on top of it with a little uh, bell siphon, mm -hmm. fill it up, and just have it run it. To get the hang just, of it. just get a little fish pump and just let it circulate. And then my little fish is my fish. Where do I put my fish? In the fish tank. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, and I okay. would just get some goldfish. Just yes. get just get some goldfish and set it up small. You know, you can set it up on your patio or anywhere. I have a little bit of lettuce. And yeah, you just put some lettuce in there. See how it grows. That's how I would start. Just to see if you like it before you go and spend a lot of money. And if you like it, build one a little bit bigger. Because you're going to learn things every time you build. And if you like that, then build bigger. And here's the other thing. For every square foot of gravel bed I have, I can put two square feet of water bed, wrap beds. So I have a 4x8 gravel bed. I can have a 4x16 wrap bed. For the same price? or for No, the, no for, for the system. Oh, okay. To keep it in balance. Nature is all about balance, and aquaponics is no different. So, again, on YouTube, you'll see people say, Oh, I converted my swimming pool, my $40,000 and I've got this little box I'm doing. No, that's not going to work. You've got to have a balance, a ratio. I, I call it the 25% rule. 
So you can never, you should never have more than 25% of the water out of your system into your gravel beds, but you should have about 25%. Okay. So if you've got a 100 gallon tank, it means you can only have 25 square feet of gravel bed. Okay, and then you can do 50 square feet of raft bed. So that's a 750 gallon tank. So I've got about 240 square feet of gravel bed here. So you gotta keep that balance. The same's true, you never wanna harvest, and you can see my, my system was a little more bare than I like, but it's because everything was so mature I had to get rid of it. Because there's another thing, you start to bring in bugs if you don't. Uh, being in an enclosed environment, the bugs like to come in. So if you let it get too mature, the bugs start to, to get to the plants. So I had to, that's why I had to feed them to the goats and chickens. But um, you never want to really harvest more than 25% of your plants either, because they help significantly in the cleaning process. So you, an aquaponic system is, is, is an ecosystem of its own, and so you want to maintain that balance. It's the same thing when you see when we go out in the food forest, everything's about balance. That's we just mimic nature in the food forest. How, how deeper? Yeah, go ahead. The balance thing proved to me. Uh, I had catfish and didn't harvest. I didn't harvest enough. They got big. They got real big. And all of a sudden, my plants were growing. They were going all the leaves. Nothing, nothing fruit. They were just growing. They would just explode. And I asked down to Brian ideas, and he said, "Sounds like you got too much nutrient." I had, I had, my fish were so big, they were overpowering the system. Oh, wow. So, so he like he says, balance, the proper number of fish, proper number. So it's, like he said, you harvest, you harvest so much of the time, and you should also harvest so much of your fish so much, if your fish get bigger. Right. I was amazed that that could be the problem. Took, I harvested out the fish, and now my system is getting more in balance. By the way, Phil is in several of my YouTube videos, and he's got one that's very, very popular where we uh, clean, we've gotten clean catfish out of his system, and he uses a spike on a two by four. And you spike the head in, and so he, he flays it without gutting it or anything. So it's it's quite a popular video. You gotta watch that if you get a chance. I, I'll throw a hint in there. Those fish were 15 months old. Two of them were eight pounds. Wow. They, they were going in an eight, by four, by two and a half feet deep. Wow. That's it. Two of them were eight pounds. The average out of 21 fish was five pounds. Wow. I had a couple that were one or two pounds, but they got so big so fast. I'm, I'm going 15 months? How can that happen? Wow. <laughs> but you're selling fish, yeah? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they taste so good. <laughs> but if you look, there's another thing about the fish. Besides using a fish that can handle your temperature zone, which catfish do, Catfish, you go to the store, they're eleven dollars a pound. You get tilapia, it's two dollars a pound. Well, which makes more sense to grow? <laughs> In fact, when we harvest our catfish, and Phil's done the same thing, there's no. If anybody's eating catfish, you know there's always a river or muddy taste to them. Not in these, because they've never had exposure to that. We usually bake them, and no one. It's not. It's not heard of to bake catfish. And we bake them. They're so light and fluffy and. I mean, it's just good stuff. All right. Well, if there's no more aquaponic questions, then I'll move out to the food forest since we're close. Yeah. Look. Has anybody ever heard of a food forest? Permaculture people. Permaculture people. That's what we are. We're we're a permaculture farm. So nature, if you if you just leave a piece of ground sit, follow. Eventually, she'll grow a forest there. That's what nature does. She, she wants to grow a forest. And there's three st stages to do that. And the first stage, almost everybody's familiar with. And if you're a permaculturist, you, you understand that there's really no such thing as a weed. But for almost everybody else, there are weeds, right? And what are, what are weeds? A good there, plant in the wrong place. There's a plant in the wrong place, but what we can typically consider weeds, they grow extremely fast. They grow roots very deep, so they're hard to get out, right? And they put off thousands of babies. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's got to be a reason for that. And it's not just to irritate us. <laughs> 
The reason is, uh, by the way, AM has done a survey of all the ground in Texas. And our land here in Central Texas, we run about 0.5% or less organic material in our soil. To be a healthy soil, anybody know how much organic material you need? More than that. At least 5%. You need at least 5% to have good soil. So nature already knows this, so what she does is she grows the weeds first to start building up that soil. That's why the plants grow very quick, they have a short life, they produce lots of babies. Because what happens when a plant photosynthesizes, it creates sugars, right? Well, a weed type plant will put about 20% of the sugars that it makes into the soil to start feeding the life in the soil. When it dies, that stock or whatever plant material, it'll start to break down, adding organic material to the soil. Also, the root system will add organic material to the soil. So nature will grow these weeds until the soil is built up enough to go to the second stage, which is where you get your shrubs and your bushes and those type of plants. When the soil is built up enough, they can exist in that type of environment. And when they start to grow, they put about 40% of what they produce of the sugars into the soil. So they, they are taking the soil to the next level. The last stage is what we call the stressors, which are trees. Right? So that's where nature wants to get to. And anybody guess how much of the sugars a tree will put into the soil? Over 90% of the sugars that they create they put in the soil. Now with a plant, whatever you see above ground is also below ground. And they now know that trees actually communicate with each other. And they can communicate up to two miles. Now, the mycorrhiza that I told you we put into the aquaponic system, that's natural in the ground. And it, it connects, and so that microbial life that exists in the ground, if, for example, a tree is short on iron, it'll change the taste of its sugar, and it'll tell the life underground, I need iron. And they'll bring iron to the tree. Or another tree might be short on potassium and they kind of communicate or maybe there's a certain type of insect that's attacking and it'll change its sugar not only so that it won't be so palatable to the insect but to warn the other trees you need to switch over because there's a bug bothering us so trees have a form of communication they also are the ones that build and maintain the soil you realize we know more about the dirt on Mars than we do about Earth's oceans. And we know far more about Earth's oceans than we do of our own soil. Yeah. You pick up a handful of healthy soil, there's more life in that handful than all the people on the planet. In just one handful of soil. Why do we not know anything about what's in the soil? I know science has identified at least five items, that, uh, but they, they really don't work on it. No, no university is working on it. There's no, you know why? Because you cannot patent something that's natural. There's no money in it. So no one cares about the soil. That's why all the drugs that you get, they might find it someplace, but it's always a synthetic form. Because they can patent the synthetic, they can't patent the natural substance. Okay? So that's why there's no research in this. But it's the healthy soil that makes healthy food. As I explained to you before, most of our vegetables come from hydroponics that's grown in the grocery stores. Man-made chemicals usually growing that stuff. That's not healthy. People eating fruits and vegetables thinking they're eating healthy, they're not eating healthy. Fruits that are transported, you realize if you have a peach tree or a plum tree or whatever, and you pick that fruit ripe, within the last 48 hours of that fruit turning ripe, it produces certain chemicals that actually help uh, prevent or fight cancer and other things that make us healthy. You pick that fruit, fruit green, it may ripen down the road, but it doesn't have that health benefit to it. So the food that we're eating, even if we're 
you know, a vegetarian, no offense to anybody who's a vegetarian, but you may not be eating near as healthy as you think you are. Because the food that's mass produced for us is just not that healthy. That's why it's important that you have your own garden, or if you don't have the time, maybe you come and to somebody like me who's growing healthy food, and, and you start participating in that. Or there's restaurants, there's, there's a lot of areas. This is growing, people are becoming more and more educated to this. But, you know, so it's not just processed foods that we all know is bad. It can also be the fruits and vegetables you're getting. The good example, if we get out to the wicking bed, I don't know how many strawberries there are, but we've been eating, we've probably gotten over six pounds of strawberries this year just off of a little patch of strawberries. And a couple weeks ago, I was at a breakfast and they had some strawberries. I couldn't even eat them. They just tasted so nasty compared to what I've been eating. And we've got blueberries growing and blackberries and just... I mean, the flavors are just unbelievable. And, that's, and when we get out to the blackberries, I'll show you, I've never watered, I've never fertilized, I've never pesticide. It's just, all we did was build, so that's what we do in a food forest is we mimic nature. We try to build a forest. And we plant trees, so one of the things we want to do is trap and hold energy. And that's in the form of water. So you'll see we built swells into the ground and we built up berms. And I've, I've got YouTube videos on this too, but it's really cool because the berms wick up. Well, you can't wick up, Mother Nature can't wick up sopping wet. So even though there's two foot of water right next to a berm, the water, on, the, the dirt on the berm is just a perfect moisture. So it can grow and sustain plants for quite a significant time. And so we grow vegetables and trees and berry bushes and all kinds of stuff in the food forest. And what we use is our uh, medium is kind of the concept of how the weeds build the soil. Well, around here we have farms and so people are growing hay. So we, we pack a good 12 inches of hay on top of our berms and let that break down. And every time like it rains, as it breaks down, your compost team your soil, your building soil, and it's just amazing how well it works. So that's why we do a food forest, is we're using nature. And by the way, the USDA won't recognize the word permaculture or sustainable farming. But they do have a word that they've used for a hundred years, and it's called agroforestry. And that's before World War II, how America farmed. You would set up berms where you had field in the middle and they would plant trees along the berms and the trees would help fertilize and feed the crop they were growing. And it would also hold and trap water. And then they would also practice crop rotation where they would grow some alfalfa or something to build up some nitrogen and maybe then come in with a, a year of cotton or something. But it was all done naturally. Since World War II, Somehow we decided that we're much smarter than Mother Nature and we've changed everything. And yeah, we've got John Deere tractors, which I have one. I love John Deere. I'm not saying, but you know, to rip up the soil and do all this. But what we're doing is we're sterilizing the earth. We're not, because now crops won't grow unless you're giving them fertilizer. Because there's nothing in the soil. So... You know, it's it's so that's what we're doing with the food forest is is we're we're planting, we're storing, and, and we're trying to get back to where nature's taking care of it. Now we do spend some energy. Uh, in fact, uh, I've got a video where the road crew was out here helping me. I I dissed and I plowed and dissed these fields out here, and they took their road grader and they 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 made the berm for me. And somebody made a comment, oh yeah, that's sure easy if you've got a road grader. I'll just go in my garage and get mine. <laughs> so, yeah, it does take some effort. Just, but once it's set up, it's there. It's forever. And um, Jeff Lofton, if you don't know, he's one of the guys I told you on YouTube you can count on. He's, he was one of Bill Mollison who kind of turned the coin permaculture. One of his right-hand guys. And... Uh, he went to Jordan and set up a, uh, they gave him 10 acres. And he put together a food forest using the principles and where it was nothing but, because it's right, it was two miles, two kilometers from the Dead Sea. 
It was all salty. Nothing would grow. Well, he's got an oasis growing there now. And the funding stopped, so they haven't even been back. And that was 10, 15 years ago. It's, it's all on YouTube. You go, and it's still thriving. Because what happened is, as the ground started to heal, it locked up all that salt. And it was allowing plants to grow again. Now, they used figs and you know more plants to that region. But he's got an oasis where nothing would grow before, just using natural concepts. And that's what we're doing in the food forest. The, back, the downside of that is it's a lot more labor intensive. So you're trading labor, whereas you know big farms, you know, you put some 18-year-old in a tractor and set it on GPS and let them listen to some tunes for eight hours, right? You don't do that in a food forest. It takes some work. So it sounds like the rain stopped. Let's go out and look at the, see what we got in blackberries. But if you can find them, you're welcome to. And then I've got this berm here. These uh, these blackberries were planted here last year in uh, January, and they these are called Primacane Arc. They're thornless, and they'll produce on the first year growth in the fall. So I'll get another crop later uh, after summer, and then they produce on the second year growth real heavy in the spring, and that's what these are, and. Um, so again, like I said, not been any watering. You can see the water here. That was just from the rain last night, how it traps and holds the water. And here's the cool thing. For every inch of water I get into the swell, I'll get five inches of wicking into the bed, into the, the swell here. And so the ground is usually, even during the summer, stays pretty moist. Now I have a tank up here. And for those of you who aren't Texan, that means a pond. <laughs> uh, and so the overflow, which I don't think this came from overflow because it was down, would come here. And I've got a YouTube video where I show how some of this washed out last year. And now you see I've got pipes. Wherever it washed out, I put pipes to keep it from washing out because I do get sometimes a lot of water. And I'll show on the YouTube how it flooded. And what I did, and then there's a creek where those trees are, that's a creek line. And so all the water would go there and be wasted on the creek. And if you look, see that berm all the way down? See that big berm all the way down there? And then there's one behind it coming back. Those are new. That's what the road crew helped me do. That berm there has 30,000 garlic cloves planted in. And no one can grow garlic commercially in Texas because it's either too wet or too dry. Okay? And but, but because it's in a swell or in a berm like that, we can grow garlic because it just wicks up a perfect amount of moisture and the garlic doesn't suffer. So we can grow commercially, but it's all hand done. So, I mean, it is labor intensive, but we can do that. And you can see here, I've got cherry trees, I've got pawpaw trees, I've got jujube trees, I've got different fruit trees. I got all kinds of stuff growing. Um, and we'll walk over to that other area where I show you I've got some of my own personal garden stuff growing. I've got grapes here. Uh, those grapes, this is their second year, and it's full of grapes. The bush is only a foot tall, and it's full of grapes. I've never been able to successfully grow grapes. Um, and I also have another video last year where I have, we'll go into the wicking bed area. I have grow bags where I grew potatoes. And I grew some sweet potatoes in them. And then I put, I had 60 slips in the grow bags for sweet potatoes. I had two slips I put in the food forest. And the food forest outproduced the grow bags. So it was harder to harvest. I, I stabbed a few potatoes trying to harvest them. But it was amazing the power that you get when you just let nature do what she wants to do. I'm so you don't have a lot of deer. No, not on this. I, I have I have rabbit and other, uh, I don't have deer. Uh, we do have bobcat and we have coyote. They don't eat the vegetables. But I do have something I can tell because I had tons of berries on here two days ago and something's eating a lot of them. There's a pack that lives up and down this creek line, and we've seen up to 15 of them out here before. So 
I asked him if I could plug. Oh yeah, local. Phil had a comment. Um, he and when he was talking about food forest, there's a, there's, I, I'm pretty sure the name is Hill Country Natives, mm -hmm. Leander, yeah. and uh, he grows a lot of native stuff. He does fruits and 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 what do you call it, landscape stuff. But he has an area that he doesn't. He just calls it a, uh, he calls it a forest garden instead of a food forest. Right. But that's a more mature. He's had some chance to grow. And, and it's just amazing. All the stuff that's in there just compact with each other. Now it grows so many layers. He has some stuff that we don't normally see, but he made the comment. He says, yeah, there's more communication going on underground than we can even imagine. He was saying the roots of the plants get together. They share that nutrient and stuff like Bob was saying. But he, he's got a lot of those things that are native and, and some stuff that you don't see in normal. Where is he? He's in Leander and, and it's... Uh, I'm pretty sure it's hillcountrynatives.com, and, and he, you go out there, you have to make an appointment to see him. Uh, he's there all the time, but he's kind of got, you know, so, but, uh, so he knows he's there, and he'll, he'll take you through and show you and talk, and he's got a lot of, a lot of interesting things going, but that, that forest that he's got growing is mature, and it shows it, it's pretty amazing. He's growing stuff that, so, there was some stuff there, I says, I, they say that won't grow here, and he says, it's been growing there for years. <laughs> Yeah. So. What do you put when you, how do you construct this, your berm? Well, you see the swell on the other side? Right. Just take my tractor and take that dirt out and put it up here. So you basically are just building a terrace? Just building a terrace, yeah. So you don't put any other materials in it? No, it's just the uh, same ground that uh, was here. Yeah, you added some of the hay to it. And, and then on top of that, I'll put hay. Right. To okay. start breaking right. down. Now, I noticed. The government came in in the 50s and terraced this whole property. This I added, but I have some up there, and I started a food forest there last uh, spring, or fall, I think, and we put hay down and stuff, but it's all caliche, and nothing's, it hasn't had anything growing on it in 60 years, and the ground is basically barren. So I planted some trees, and they're, they're doing okay, but I planted some vegetables and they're not really growing. It's just caliche. So what I'm going to have to do there, and I'll make some videos on that, I'm going to have to layer it. Where I'll, I'll put down cardboard, then I'll put down hay, then I'll put down manure. I don't know if anyone knows locally, uh, Swetner. they will give me all the cow manure I can take. But, uh, you know, he's one of the biggest cattle people in the country. And so he's happy to get rid of some manure. So I'll put that on, then I'll put more hay on and just let it sit for a year and break down and then maybe next summer because it's just nasty i mean compacted it, it's just hard ground and so i've discovered that you can't just you know usually if you if you if you watch jeff lofton and some of these it takes them about four years to really establish uh, a berm and and they're they're putting in uh legumes and and ground cover and then they're chopping it and letting it die and then they're, they're doing that for several years well I'm getting kind of old I didn't want to wait several years so I'm trying to shortcut it with the hay which worked fine in this area but it's not working as well there so I'm gonna have to do something more intensive up there and it's kind of the same concept if anybody's heard of the back to Eden type gardening where they use wood chips and they'll stack them they'll let them sit for several years and then the ground it basically makes new ground so that's the same kind of concept we're trying to do here is develop the soil. By the way, uh, if you want, yeah, go ahead. I have another question. Do you run in, I'm thinking part of the issue up there is long-term use of herbicides. I mean, this it hasn't had anything for 60 years. Part of the government program was okay, did, the, the people who owned the, on it? nothing. They, they couldn't, they couldn't farm it. They couldn't do, they couldn't even put oh, a garden on it. Okay. They had to sit barren and that was a 50 year program. When we bought the property in 99, it was in its last year. They were paying the farmer, the, the property owner, $600 a year not to do anything with his land. Right. And I think in 2001, that. that program ended and we didn't renew it. But <laughs> we just haven't had time to do, you know, because I was working, we have five kids. I mean, life happens, right? And so just if it was it's, it's just the last few years we've been able to start doing some of this stuff. And uh, so that ground, I mean, that, that's an example. Now there are some few trees popping up there, but 60 years or more and that ground is still Nothing cool. barren. Nothing good on 
Uh, no, it's more like like right here. You see where this is like swamp grass? Mm -hmm. That's all that would grow, and you know that's not good for anything. It's not, and so that's. And you can see the ground here is still not very good. So, but I mean I'm growing stuff now, so the concept is proving out. But this is at least black soil up there. It's just gray limestone right. caliche type stuff, and it's pretty bad. So how big is the farm? We're about 70 acres. So, um, one other thing I was going to say, Phil helped me, there's a video on it, we made a garlic planting tool, and uh, it's pretty cool, it's got seven prongs, you step on it, and it was designed for the food forest, and it, it makes seven holes, and we popped the garlic, that's how we planted that 30,000 heads of garlic there, but we also used it for onions, and you can see in this one, see some of the garlic and onions that are growing, and you just put the tool every six inches, pop holes in and just stick the onions in and because we're trying to do it commercially you know if you, you always see everybody packs it in tight and it, well, I, I don't have that kind of time it's just me and, and Mo and he's in some of the videos too so uh, we just made the holes pop pop the onion starts in and left them and they grew, they grew so nature finds a way I mean plants that's what they want to do is survive so but if you again you set up the balance and uh, It'll work. Yeah, I don't have anybody ever heard of pawpaw trees? Sure. Those are pawpaws. They'll grow hair just fine, but you don't get pawpaw fruit because you can't pick it green and ship it. Pawpaw fruit can only be picked ripe. So there's about two weeks out of the year that people can pick pawpaw fruit. And you you, yeah, usually don't trees? buy. Huh? Where'd you get your trees? I got those from Stark Brothers. Oh, okay. But. Uh, some of the other trees we got here are from Womack. In fact, Phil and I took a trip up to Womack and we got some trees. And There's a video on that too. They're great people up there. In fact, we met grandfather, son, and grandson. So they're great people. They got all kinds of trees they don't even have in their catalog. So if you go up there, they, and they're willing to help you out. And it's pretty, pretty, you buy, well, even Brian bought some trees up there. So anyway, that's the... Food forest. I want to walk over there to where the one we did a couple years ago where we started this concept just to see and uh, but anyway I, I'm, I don't want to finish but the reason we put that berm in there is to capture and hold water we, we got to store that energy instead of letting it go to the creek so now when all the water rushes down it has to flow all the way down to that end of the farm and then come all the way back and we, we just yeah, it looks like a lake when we get water going. It's just amazing. But let's wait, make our way over here and we'll show you where we started. It, different things grew up everywhere. We had pumpkins and cantaloupe and butternut. I mean, just all, I didn't even know I had some little seeds in there. It, it was just incredible. Now this one, we went ahead and we planted some. Um, but you see, I've got peppers and watermelon and squashes and, and uh, you see all those bags there. People, when they, in the city, bag up their leaves. They, and then the city will only pick up two bags a week. So a lot of people know me now and they'll bring me their leaves. And we'll just put them out here and let them start to decay and become part of the, instead of doing hay, we'll just put the leaves down. It's all the same principle. But you can see here, now, what I wanna show you, these trees, look how big these trees are. They're going, they're just now going, they were planted January two years ago. So they're not even two and a half years old. When I got them, they were all like 12 inches, 18 inches tall. And look how look how well they're doing. And again, they haven't been watered or weed eated. I mean, uh, pesticided or fertilized or anything. Just hay put down. You don't but, put water this uh, during summer, like it's uh, twice per well, week. No. Well, during the you see the garden hose. So during the summer, sometimes. Uh, it does get dry and I'll have to water the plants, the vegetables. That's why we grow them, a lot of them here. And we'll grow, uh, and so we will water the vegetables and I've got the wicking beds and we'll put water here too. Uh, so the vegetables sometimes do need a little bit more water, but the trees, again, they're the stressors. They can handle it not without much, they can wait between rains usually. And you can see how much energy is stored just from the water from last night. 
So when you, when you set this up, you, you store a lot of energy. But uh, this is where we start it. I've got uh, uh, Juby. What else? Phil, not Juby. There, Go Goji. Goji, Goji yeah. bushes, figs, several different types of trees. And then here, I don't know if you can tell. Can anybody tell me what this plant is right here? Comfrey. 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 Why is it? Why is comfrey important to put into a food forest or any garden actually? Dynamic accumulator. Which means what? It's going to pull up the minerals underneath. It's From how far down? Up. They'll actually grow 100 feet to deep. Yeah, oh, wow. so, yeah. And they'll pull minerals, they'll even go through our limestone. And they'll pull minerals up. What else is good about them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> as far as water? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. And then, the, uh, and then uh, make an excellent uh, fertilizer with that also. Make fertilizer. It's also extremely healthy for animals. And you can make tincture out of it. Yes. For, for humans. But the leaves are the highest nitrogen producing leaf on the planet. So you can mow that just like grass. Just leave the leaves lay there and they'll nitrogenate your soil for you. So even if you don't have a food forest, but you have some fruit trees, you might want to plant some comfrey uh, by them. Now there's two types. There's one that's very aggressive and will just spread like crazy. Then this type here is just uh, done through the root system. And so it won't uh, overtake. And you, and you, you so just be aware, you might want one that just takes over everything, but uh, I don't because I want to grow vegetables and other things. That's what we do here. So what's the name of the good one? I think the, it's Russian is the variety that, that spreads all the way from the root. You have to spread it from the root. You have to actually take the root to buy them. Okay. I think it's the Russian comfort. Uh, you can Google that to be check us. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious when you look on, on the Amazon, they say 50 comfrey seeds. That's the one you don't want. <laughs> yeah, if it's stung by seed, you don't want it. And usually, I've seen nurseries around here, but they all have the aggressive kind. We ordered that online. In fact, Phil, I think Phil ordered it. We split the order, and now I've got more comfort, and I know what to do. Here, let me bet you need, you need anywhere from eight up to 12 inches. You, and if you can get to 12 inches, that's better. So these beds here, these, these containers, see the pipes that go down and you see down on the end there's a pipe about four inches up coming out so there's a, a reservoir in those containers a rock reservoir and then there's some weed barrier on top of that so roots can't grow down into it and then you can put whatever medium you want to grow in on top for example there's blueberries guess what you can't grow blueberries in Texas because our soil is around a pH of 8, and blueberries like to be around a 4 or 5. And there's some on there, if they're ripe, you can try try one, try to get enough for everybody to get one, but uh, those, those blueberries, there's no dirt there. Those blueberries, it's 50% peat moss, 50% pine bark. No dirt, and look how well those plants are doing. They're only a couple years old. Throw in the thing I kept thinking, oh, I think they need to be more acid. They need to be more acid, so I kept putting some acid or some pH down in it. And all of a sudden, the plant died. <laughs> I checked it, and I had my pH was down about three. <laughs> they didn't like that. It is, but it's not going to be at that rate. Yeah. So the, the theory of a wicking bed is just like in a food forest, yeah. where Every once in a while, we'll put water in, into the pipes, and underneath is a perforated pipe. And we'll just fill it up until it starts pouring out the, the side holes. And then we know that reservoir is full, and then we don't have to come back and water until you know, it looks like the plants need water again. In the summertime, it might be about every four or five days. In the wintertime, it could be every three to four weeks. Or if we get enough rain, we don't need to do it at all. But uh, the concept is, is that the water will wick up, just like in the food forest, and just keep it a perfect moisture. I imagine if you dig in here a little bit, even though we've had all this rain, you'll see that it's not real sopping wet and muddy. It's just a nice moisture. And I'll tell you, it's really good. I have different systems because not everything 
And that's another thing on YouTube, they'll say, oh, aqua pies is the answer to world hunger. Well, it's not. Aqua pies can do some things extremely well. Wiki beds can do some things extremely well. Aqua bars, it, 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 it kind of takes everything to, to, to be sustainable. You, not one thing is the answer to everything. But uh, if you live in an apartment or a smaller area, wiki beds are a wonderful way to go. And they're somewhat portable. I mean, it takes two guys to lift it, but you can move them. They just have to be level. And uh, this one here, I've got ginger root growing, cilantro, asparagus. They're really good for herbs, things that might be very aggressive out in the field or in the garden that you want to contain, or maybe you don't want to grow too much of it. In my case, I have never in my life, and I have gardened since I can remember, just being a little kid, I have never in my life been able to grow strawberries. Look at this strawberry patch, and we've already got about six pounds of strawberries off of this. And I'm telling you, these things, if you come over, you can find some and eat them. They're the sweetest, most, they don't, I mean, you'll never want another strawberry again once you've tasted these. Now here's the trick I found, uh, and see, I, I still got flowers, and there's some berries coming on. Um, these plants are two years old. So right now, or, you know, when spring comes, everybody's got strawberries out, right? Well, those plants won't produce. I mean, they'll get little berries. So last year I did that and I cut off the berries and I didn't let them grow and then in the winter time mowed them. Just cut them all down. Covered it with hay. In the springtime they all came back and that's when they're producing. So strawberries are really a two year crop. They'll actually grow more. You, you can Every year they'll be a little smaller but they'll put out some babies too that next year will grow good. But um, that's why no one has success with strawberries is because they're, 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 they're basically growing little kids when they need to be adults since so you have to wait a year. So anyway, wicking bed's a great environment to contain and, and hold them. Uh, and then these, you guys want some of these? These are chives we've had growing on the farm since 19, 2009. And each one of these was just one. And you just, you just split them up and, and plant them. That's, that's the concept behind wicking beds, and it's a great way to grow certain things. Yeah, if you can find a strawberry, wow. give it a try. Isn't that good? Oh, come share that, babe. Yeah. <laughs> wait, here. babe, wait, wait, wait. Let's see. And then someone. Okay, here, who wants a strawberry? If you eat the strawberry, you gotta give a critique. You want one? Is that good? Does that taste like a strawberry you'd get out of the store? Look, I cooked this morning. It tastes anything like that. What do you do in the summer, the strawberry? Is it growing? I'm sorry, say that again? What do you do in summer? What happened with strawberry? They'll grow all summer. They're growing. It's growing. It can produce... Yeah, look, they even got new flowers. No, it can produce... Yeah. Berries? Yes. Like it's nice. Yeah, it'll produce all summer. It's... You know, come fall, they'll quit growing. So I'm getting some critters in here eating some of them. The bugs like them too. Anyway, any questions on the wicking beds? So you fertilize through the water? No. No, again, no fertilizing. See here? I got wood chips. Oh, so that's it. That's it. <laughs> just, just like everything else on the farm, we don't, we don't fertilize. I will use compost tea sometimes. Here I don't need to because the wood chips or, or the hay is doing its own compost tea. In the greenhouses, I will make my own compost tea. But no fertilizer. So it has wood chips. On here, on, on this one, I was luckily enough to get a load of wood chips, so I've been using wood chips in my uh, wicking beds. Yeah. So there's gravel and wood chips. That's all that there is. No, no. gravel. There's gravel for the first four inches. That's the reservoir, because gravel will allow water to wake up. And then there's a weed barrier, 
you know, the black that you see. So it's it's down over the gravel so that uh, the roots won't grow down into it and clog it all up. Are you putting the drain above the weed barrier or in the gravel? The, 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 the drain's at four inches, the rock's at four inches, and the gravel, the weed barrier's on top. Okay. And then you can put whatever medium, like I said, in there there's not even dirt. But you can set it up however, whatever you plan to grow, you can put whatever type of soil. different plants like different types of environment. So you can, for example, over there, we got raspberries growing. Typically you don't grow raspberries in Texas either. <laughs> so, well, like his comment, I uh, plug compost tea. I do compost tea in the wicking beds and the soil garden. And I can see an almost an immediate difference when I started with the compost tea on the soil. Actually, Phil has She said, thank you. <laughs> All right. If we don't have any more questions, you guys want to move out to the chickens? Sure. Right. Um, uh, as Phil will tell you, I never do anything small. You know, he'll, he'll plant two or three vegetables and maybe a fruit tree. I'll plant, you know, 50 trees and we planted 2,000 vegetables. Well, chickens are the same. My goal is to eventually have 1,250 birds. That way, we've always got 250 in, in cycle because for commercial purposes, a chicken is good for about two years. It takes them six months to start laying, and then you get about two years. And they'll still lay after that, of course, but on a commercial scale, it's not really equitable at that point, so you just sell them off. So if I have 1,250 birds, I can always have six, uh, one group of 250 growing. As soon as they start laying, I can get rid of the last 250 and just keep that cycle going. So I basically should always have about a thousand birds laying. That's the goal. We're not there. I mean, again, it's me and Mo and John Deere usually working out here. So uh, it takes time to do that. But <laughs> this is where we're at right now. We built that chicken tractor. It'll hold 250 birds. We're uh, going to be building a new one. I uh, it's going to be better, but it only holds 125 birds. But we can put it on a trailer, it, it's transportable, it's, it's a lot more flexible than this. I have to use my John Deere tractor to move this. And uh, the one we're going to be building will be half this size. And you'll be able to use a lawn tractor or something to pull it with. So first I wanted to show you this is how we water. Um, so I've had this trailer sitting on the property for years, never taking it off. So, and I, somebody gave me this wood. This tank I used to use to uh, store water for uh, the troughs for the animals. So I just put it all together one day and made a tank. So it's a 500 gallon tank and we just use a hose and that's how we keep the birds watered. And th this will last a good six weeks for the birds we got now. And I've got another 250 gallon tank on another trailer. So I'm sure when we get more birds, this will be cycled out a lot more often. Yeah, you can open, that one is the feed, the pelletized feed. And this one, I don't know if anybody's heard of, anybody know what chaffa hay is? This is chaffa hay. 
Take a smell. Come, come over and take a smell. It's hay, it's wet. Yeah. Yeah, it's moist. Yeah, moist. Yeah. Of course, it is. This, this is, uh, this is ground up alfalfa uh, mixed with molasses. So it's probiotic. You can feed it to all your animals. We feed it to the goats, to the horses, and uh, we feed it to our chickens. Even the dogs will eat it. I didn't know they would, but you put it out there for the goats and the dogs will eat it. So this is really healthy for them. And so I give them a, a scoop of this uh, in the morning and a scoop in the evening. Where are you get it? Uh, you, can, you can buy it at feed stores. Really? There's a guy in, uh, do you live close by? Uh, Southwest. Okay, there's a guy in Florence I buy it from because he, he's got a bunch of exotic animals. That he, and so he, he buys enough that, so he distributes. I just buy it from him. It's, um, it's $13.50 for a 50 pound bag and it's equivalent to a 90 pound bale of alfalfa. But see how fine it is? So there's no waste, they eat it all. And the chickens love it. So it's, it's healthy for them. In fact, I have uh, people wanted to see. Because okay. I just put that in yesterday, but I saved the bag. It's made here in Texas, up uh, by El Paso. Texas and oh wait, let me bring it home because I can't. I haven't ever done that. Wait, I'll just take a picture of you holding it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, they got it. Thank yeah, you, Sarah. No, they, it's already done. And, it, and the bags are sealed. They'll last for 18 months. Sealed. Once you open them. But uh, I'll go through a bag maybe every two weeks with these birds. But it just helps keep the, them healthy. I do you Yeah, you can grow alfalfa in Texas. Typically, you don't feed it to horses because in Texas we have the... Uh, blister beetle and it'll kill a horse in minutes so typically alfalfa grown in texas doesn't go to but this is in new, the border between texas and new mexico so they don't have that up there so it's not a problem all right so you want to go see the tractor it's on it's on wheels and uh, i've got gutters on either side so i trap and hold the rainwater Come on in. technology I used to build the greenhouse I built this house with and so the one downside you see this bar that goes through the middle so there's always pressure trying to push the walls out so I had to put that in the middle to hold it the new green the new ones I'm building are one piece of pipe so there's no pressure pushing out and uh, it's going to be a lot more stable but here I show you this is where I had the rollout you know, the concept was that the eggs would be laid and rolled out. Mm -hmm. Sounds great, I and mean, <laughs> reality doesn't work. These are very expensive, and just don't, just use a box with hay. That's just the cheapest, cleanest way to, to do it. And uh, and then here's the water trough. This is another thing. Um, you see how I put the top on the water trough? A cap? So they can't foul in it. Oh, smart. So I've got a float here that works off of the hose and it just gravity feeds into the trough and so they can't get it dirty. Mm -hmm. So I only have to clean it out like once uh, every six months. Mm -hmm. And and so it keeps, because that's one of the biggest problems with chicken is keeping the water clean. Mm -hmm. And this way you don't have to. Is this the same plastic you used over in the other place? It is place? the same plastic but this is opaque so it'll block 95% of the sun. Okay. 
And uh, so actually, in the summertime when it's really hot outside, the chickens will be in here because really? it's cooler. Mm -hmm. And if you look up on the wall, I've got a battery and a light and a solar system. So in the wintertime, I've got the light comes on at 4 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and goes off about the time sun comes up so that the birds keep laying. You know, now if you got a backyard system and stuff, you probably don't want. But again, I'm I'm doing this for money. Sure. So, and I'm so I'm using the birds for two years, and I know some people don't like that, but you know, I've I've got to I got to get as much production as I can. And this is plastic, yeah. Yeah, those are plastic. Mm -hmm. And then these these go up, so you can close them at night, but the birds still get in there and. You don't suggest to do this. You put, like, I would not spend gloves. waste any more money on this. Yeah, I, I bought three of them. Thought it would be kind of a. It sounded like a great concept, sure. But in reality, it doesn't work. I just buy. I just get a regular box or build your own and just use hay. Cause see, they don't they don't mess in the hay, but in the box they, they'll just and the eggs come out filthy. Now I do have an egg cleaning machine I use in the house. I have a video on that too, but. You know, it's better if you don't have to clean them. Sure. Well, it's what all of these chicken eggs will be here. Yeah, it's enough room for them. Oh yeah, them. yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, about one box for every ten birds. There's thirty boxes here, so if I got 250 birds, that's plenty. Okay. And it's funny. There's some boxes they'll never lay in, and right. they'll they'll put 20 eggs in one box. Yeah, they'll <laughs> so, fight over the same box. You know, yeah. so this rule that every you know only so many boxes per. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me. Because the chickens don't know that rule. Is there like some boxes? Some yeah. <laughs> yeah, the chickens didn't read the book. All right, it, whoever takes the cheesecake, we're going to document it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to end a tour with a lunch. Fat belly. It doesn't even taste good. Don't want any. It's like broccoli and, and liver. Broccoli and liver. Oh, this is good. This is good. Broccoli sounds good. But so not the we liver. got it documented that you're eating the sweets first. <laughs> mm -hmm. this no, is that's, my, that's your veggie and a muffin. This is beets and goat cheese. That's in a healthy. meal. It's healthy. And it's round, which means no calories. <laughs> there you go. Mm. Well, I like round things with no calories. Anybody have a comment on today? Did they? I learned learn? a lot. What did you yeah. learn? I learned I can grow blueberries mm. in Texas. <laughs> Good. Excellent. What else? Anybody else? Yeah, I'll draw one on you. Growing them is the easy part, keeping the birds out. Oh, yeah. there we go. Yeah, my, we need, a, we need a, one, a whole thing on that. <laughs> yeah, the chickens were up there eating on them yesterday. I was told you were having problems with chicken hawks. Yes, that's what the scarecrows are for. Are they helping? They do help a great deal. We had a we, turkey that was running them off. We, we had to put a second one up, though. And if you notice, we got T-posts throughout. We found about every week we have to change them. Because if they're stuck, if they're in the same spot, the birds are smart, they'll know. And uh, so if you, you got to move them around and that keeps them away. So what we want to do is get a dress, put on one of them. Maybe they'll be scared of the window. I'm going to put the clothesline as they're out there. Yeah, do a clothesline on huh? So, what did you see today? What did you like? Uh, what did you learn anything? What did you take away that was most important? Well, I, I felt like uh, Bob has a great deal of knowledge about the subject and I especially learned a lot about the food forest and how that works. I, I hadn't read anything about that or seen anything on that so that was very informative and very interesting um, of course I, I like his concepts of all the different types and methods of things that he's tried and sees what works and what doesn't 
That's very informative. I appreciate it. Time.